Today's topic is the mystery of financial fees. Journalist Ben Steverman shares a story that about 140 years ago, retailer, one very savvy retailer from Philadelphia by the name of John Wanamaker, realized that his customers and his salespeople were wasting way too much of their time haggling over price. And he came up with a creative solution to put clearly marked labels on every item in his stores. What do you know it? Before long, his uh, salespeople stopped wasting time, his customers had a better experience, and profits soared. Soon enough, virtually every retailer in the country and every business in the country had followed Wanamaker's lead, employing this innovation by putting price tags on everything that they sold. The only exception to that rule were companies and businesses that were making far too much money off the ignorance of their consumers. And unfortunately for investors, financial services was one of those exceptions. It's hard to evaluate anything for which the price tag isn't clearly visible. Most of us remember what we paid for the last gallon of gasoline or the last cup of coffee, because we see those prices. But we don't pay nearly enough attention to all the financial fees that we pay and how they are paid. And yet, we know that even the smallest difference in price on financial fees could have tremendous impacts for, on our portfolio. Financial fees are difficult because of the asymmetry. It's the asymmetry of information between the sellers and the buyers, where the sellers know much more about what they're selling than the buyers about what they're buying. And that asymmetry creates an environment that's ripe for abuse. And the data reflects that. In a 2013 study on 1,000 Canadians, over the age of 25, with over $25,000 of investable assets, researchers found that somewhere in the range of 25% of investors actually thought that they didn't directly or indirectly pay their advisors anything. They thought they paid them nothing. Another 19% thought they paid their advisors something, but they had no clue what it was and where it came from. In a study conducted by the Ontario Securities Commission, 73% of investors thought that their advisors would look out for their best interest, irrespective of how much they were paid and how they were paid. And according to the National Bureau of Economic Research, it was clear that most investors consult with product-oriented advisors or brokers and believe that's prudent and sufficient to make decisions on the very products that these advisors and brokers are proposing. As a consequence, Canadians pay some of the highest fees in the world. In fact, in a 2011 report by Morningstar, a US-based research firm, Canadians received an F for mutual fund fees. It was the only one out of 22 countries that received a failing grade. Studies in the US show that nearly 25% of the growth on investors' retirement savings will go towards the financial fees. In Canada, this number is actually closer to 50. The irony of all of this is that many investors believe that they have some control over the returns they achieve and virtually no controls over the fees, whereas the exact opposite is true. There's also no data that links high fees to outperformance. In fact, to the contrary, Morningstar had to reluctantly agree that fees, low fees, are a more robust indicator of superior future performance, at least in mutual funds, than even their own four-star rating system. Study after study demonstrates that investors do not have a firm understanding of the fees that they pay and the impact that those fees have on their portfolios. It should also be noted that financial fees are generally unregulated, which means that it is entirely up to the investors to determine whether the fees that they are paying are outlandish or not. But before we get to what fees are actually considered outlandish, the more important question that we have to ask ourselves, why are fees so critical to our investment success? Besides the fact that we're taking money out of our pocket and giving it to somebody else, why do fees have such a profound effect on the success of our investments? To answer that question, let me share with you a story that I read from Dan and Chip Heath's book, Switch. They shared that in the late 1980s, 
British Petroleum, the oil and gas giant better known as BP, made a strategic decision to focus on the larger oil fields rather than pursuing the smaller ones, which have countless other competitors. At the same time, management was resolute about cutting costs. At the time, BP had one of the best hit rates in the oil exploration industry. They hit one out of every five wells. To put that in context, the historic average was closer to one out of eight. Management, however, was insistent that the exploration costs be cut from $5 a barrel to $1 a barrel. The expectation seemed untenable and unreasonable because it meant that BP would have to go from being exceptional to being flawless. If they had to cut 80% of their costs, they had to cut 80% of their failed attempts, which means BP would have to hit oil each and every time that they drilled. The explorers were up in arms. They believed this was an impossibility. Management, however, instead of giving in, decided to reinforce the idea, and they instituted a company-wide policy called No Dry Holes. Essentially, management was insistent that explorers not lose a single dollar on any exploration, on any drill, on any well. You see, BP management realized that their problem wasn't one of poor geological skills or reckless spending. Their problem was a misalignment of incentives between management and the explorers. If explorers struck a huge reserve, they were to be heroes. But if they failed, well, they were no worse off than 80% of the others. BP management also discovered that the explorers were pretty darn good at gauging the prospects of the wells. When they assessed that the probability of success was 75%, the wells were a hit almost every time. Whereas when they estimated the probability of success to be 10%, the wells were a hit less than 1% of the time. To sell management on a new drilling location, all the explorers had to do was play with the expected value spreadsheet and increasing the expected payoff of any particular well. So imagine that you had a 10% probability of hitting a billion dollar reserve or an 80% probability of hitting a million dollar reserve. Well, the 10% billion dollar reserve has an expected value of $100 million. Whereas the 80% probability of hitting a million dollar well only has an expected value of $800,000. The explorers became venture capitalists speculating with BP's money, with BP's capital, and management needed to rein in that behavior. The no dry holes policy forced the explorers to focus on the decision-making process, on the quality of the underlying information, and the conviction that they brought to each and every decision. The unambiguous nature of no dry holes forced them to focus not on the prospects for return, but the prospects for loss. The end result was certainly not perfection, but it was an industry leading 67% a success story previously considered impossible. The BP story serves as a fitting metaphor for the critical role of incentives as the most important consideration when it comes to fees. It demonstrates that by carefully managing incentives, investors can not only save money, but they could also reduce their risk while potentially amplifying their return. Time and again, it has proven that for the best indication of someone's future behavior, take a closer look at how they are being compensated and which behaviors are being rewarded.